So, well, I... Jack, have you got all the lights on there, Jack? It's a bit dim over here. That's better. That's better than my answer. You can see it now. <laughs> well, uh, I spent, uh, this is like week three of a little series I've been doing on the sayings of Jesus, and I just thought over August it would be really good just to look at some of the things Jesus said. And as Esme pointed out, I deliberately chose not to do the I am statements, okay, because that would have been too predictable. But what I, what I did was, I, I, in the first week, I looked at this uh, saying of Jesus where he said, you are the salt of the earth. And I made the point uh, that Jesus wants us to be distinct in this day and age. He wants us to be people that stand out and uh, not allow ourselves to be diluted by this world. Um, and um, not allow our faith to be diluted. And I think that's something of what Jesus was saying there. And then last week I looked at this um, famous saying about it's easier for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. And I was suggesting that Jesus was talking to this rich young guy, rich young ruler, who, although he had all this material wealth, he was actually spiritually poor, and, Jesus, and his wealth was actually blinding him from seeing that. And you know how God wants us to look at our lives and look at our world with a kingdom perspective. Um, and you can check out those two talks if you're bored one day, they're <laughs> online. Um, but I'm going to speak about one of the other well-known sayings of Jesus this morning. And I chose it for a slightly different reason, but it's this. Uh, John 7 verse 38 says this, very famous verse. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And we get this out of the way first of all. I'm not trying to be flashy here by talking about the Greek, but the Greek helps here because... The, the, the NIV is a little bit like flat. Water will flow from within them. Where in fact the word there in the Greek is this word koilias, which means womb or belly or innermost place. Out of your innermost place will flow rivers of living water. It's a bit more powerful. It's a bit more, bit more impactful, I think. So, what was Jesus talking about we're going to find out. Jesus was speaking these words, first of all, in a very tricky and dangerous moment in his ministry. Uh, his family are questioning him. Uh, the Jewish leaders are trying to kill him, literally. And people are calling him demon-possessed. And it actually says, just before that uh, verse I read, that the crowds tried to seize Jesus but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. I love that. No one could touch Jesus until his time had come. In fact, at this, this point in the narrative, the temple guards have actually been sent to arrest Jesus by the Pharisees and the chief priests. So it's a really tense moment. Things are really hotting up uh, for Jesus. Um, when, when did this happen? What part of... what? Part of the Jewish year did this happen in? Does anyone know? Come on, you do. <laughs> Not Passover. No. Come on, someone knows. Tabernacles. Oh, yeah. Everyone say tabernacles. <laughs> you're, you're very obedient. This happened in tabernacles. I'll read, I'll read it. I'll read the, um, the bit in a moment where the verse is found. But come on, we need to know this. What, is, what are the other two big Jewish festivals? There's three big ones. Every year they handed out to Jerusalem. Tabernacles was one of them. What was the other one? Shabbat. 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 You're talking Hebrew. Oh. <laughs> Shabbat. It's a piece of weeks or Pentecost as we know it. And the other one, Bob, is Pesach, which is Passover. And of course, Tabernacles is Sukkot. Everyone say Sukkot. Sukkot. Oh. So obedient. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was actually in Jerusalem at Sukkot with Ian. It was such a, by accident, can I just say, we didn't really know that was going to be Sukkot. Um, 
which is a rather, this is really bothering me, this bentness. This um, so here we go. I mean, what happened at Tabernacles? What, what do Jewish people do at Tabernacles? They still do it in Israel. They build Tabernacles, like little tents, to remember the time when they were in the wilderness, in tents. So they, they build tents. It, it's something it's not intense. It's very intense. I, I've missed the heckling, I'm telling you. Heckle away. But, um, or content. Content. Um, what am I talking about? Yeah, like basically, they have a seven day camping holiday. Who likes camping holidays? Woo! I love camping holidays. They had a seven day camping holiday to remember the time that they were in the wilderness, wandering around. This is what happens. We pick up the story, verse 37. It says, in the last and greatest day of the festival, that's day seven, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from the innermost being. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. I love this. On hearing the words of Jesus, some people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. I would like to have been there. It would have been something to behold. And the thing about this verse is, it really has an open and shut interpretation. Jesus states it, he says, he makes it clear that he's talking about the giving of the Spirit, the giving of the Spirit of God. And we know that when Jesus died on the cross and he rose again, we know that on the day of Pentecost he gave his Spirit to the church. And that's what he's talking about. But there's something puzzling about this verse, Jan. Have you spotted it? Spotted it? It's, the, it's these words in that verse. As scripture has said. That doesn't seem to be puzzling, you might be thinking, but it is because these words don't actually appear in the Old Testament. You say, I know, it's a shock. <laughs> Nowhere in the Old Testament does it say, whoever believes in me, as scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus certainly isn't directly quoting the Old Testament here. So, like I've done the last couple of weeks, um, let me just tell you a couple of the ways that some people try to handle this anomaly in the scripture. First of all, some people say maybe the verse is missing from the Old Testament. Sometimes it's referred to as the missing verse. And the suggestion is that for some reason what Jesus was quoting from has been lost. Now, Probably like me, you struggle with that sort of approach because, like, I believe this book was authored by God. Yeah. I really do. Yes, it was written by people, but it was written by people inspired by God because yeah. Scripture says all Scripture is God breathed. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes people think you're stupid and sometimes they think you're naive to believe that, but that's what I believe and I've lived my life by it, as have you. Amen. And it's proved me to be true. Yeah. And trustworthy. Yes. So I don't think God forgot to put a verse in, personally. No. That's just my opinion. <clears throat> Others have tried to sort of pin certain verses on this missing verse. Because there's a lot of talk about water in the Old Testament. There's a lot of talk about thirsting and streams. And maybe Jesus is referring to one of these verses in the Old Testament. Like Isaiah 55, come to me, or you who are thirsty, come to the waters. But it's not talking about waters flowing out of our innermost place. What about the rock in the wilderness, when the rock gets struck, which is a picture of the death of Christ, and the water comes out of the rock, which is the picture of the giving of the Spirit? Could that be it? Well, it isn't talking about water coming out of our bellies. I love that word, belly. <laughs> Bellies. It's a possibility. Others have, have tried to reorder the, reorder the sentence. In, in the Greek, we know there's no punctuation. So sometimes the emphasis, it can shift. And some people say it should be like this. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me to drink. 
whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. That this is talking about the belly of Jesus, the innermost being of Jesus. Jesus declaring himself to be the source. So different people have tried to, to tackle this missing verse in different ways. Are you following me? Yeah. yeah. So, what's the answer? Well, I think we do have to pin a passage on what Jesus is talking about here. I think he's saying that there's something in the Old Testament that this truth expresses, that this truth refers to. And I think there's only one passage, one passage in the Old Testament that Jesus was referring to when he spoke about rivers of living water coming from the innermost being of Tegan and David and Noah. <coughs> Anyone know what it is? Yes. Well done. You can come to church again. <laughs> Now, you'll tell me this is your first time in church for 18 months. 18 months. Hey. Aww. Aww. And, you, and you answered the question right. <laughs> well done. Yeah. I'm not going to read it all because we haven't got time. We want to go home. Uh, but, but when you go home, check it out. Check out this passage. Probably Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48 are probably the most difficult chapters in the Bible. It's in my, my opinion. They're difficult. But sort of tucked away in there, in these perplexing chapters, we have these 12 verses in which Ezekiel sees a, a vision of a temple with a river yeah. flowing from it. I'll read a little bit of it. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south sides. And it goes on to describe how the man follows a river and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and, and stronger and stronger and stronger until he cannot cross the river anymore. You can go ahead and read that. Then it says, then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Araba, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty waters become fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt, I love this, it makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Has anyone been in the Dead Sea? Yeah. A, few, a few. Did you float on it? Did you do yeah. a floaty thing? Uh, just Ian's got here, it's like an embarrassing, but he, we went to the Dead Sea and people were doing the floaty thing and he just dived in. Oh. <laughs> do not do that in the Dead Sea. And, when, and he was like freaking out when he came out and this man was standing next to him and said, why did you do that? <laughs> True story. <laughs> But anyone who knows Ian knows that. Yeah. He did the same in the Jordan. There, there were a bunch of these like Greek, uh, Russian Orthodox, Orthodox, Russian Greek Orthodox Christians, and they were doing this thing in the River Jordan. And Ian just stripped off and got in the River Jordan with them was dancing around. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So it's relevant. Sorry, Ian. I don't know here. What am I actually talking about? Get this. This is so. This is so good. You'll never see this passage the same way again. Jesus is where when he's teaching and he's saying these words. Where is he? On the Feast of Tabernacles, where is he preaching from? He's in the temple. Jesus is standing in the temple on the greatest final day of the Feast of Tabernacles, talking about rivers flowing out of our innermost beings. And Ezekiel sees a river coming out of a temple flowing out of it. And where does the river come from? It comes from the innermost part of the temple, the most holy place. And what happened in the most holy place? It was the place where a man met gods yeah. every year. That's got to be, like, that's got to be significant. 
There's some sort of parallel going on here. And, and there's more to this. This is a tiny bit of history, I'm really sorry, but it's important. The vision of the temple that was given to Ezekiel was given in 573 BC, 13 years after the destruction of the first temple, and 57 years before the building or completion of the second temple. So when Ezekiel was seeing his vision of the temple, there was no temple. That's interesting, Roger. But it is... <laughs> It honestly is because, and like you can try and understand these chapters however you like in Ezekiel, but I think what God is showing Ezekiel in 40 to 48, he's showing them the blueprints, if you like, the scale dimensions, the pattern to which the second temple had to be built. That's what I think is going on in this whole vision. Because how else would have the exiles, when they went back to Jerusalem, know how to have built the temple? It was destroyed. So get this, in the temple vision of Ezekiel, like people often say this is the third temple, have you heard that? Yeah. There's going to be a third temple. Sometimes people say it's the millennial temple. Let me just humbly suggest it isn't. The temple that Ezekiel saw was the second temple. The very one that Jesus was standing in on the Feast of Tabernacles. And I think Ezekiel is seeing a vision of something 600 years into the future, that out of the time of the Second Temple period in which Jesus lived and ministered, rivers of living water would be released. The vision is speaking about a historical moment, and Jesus is almost standing at the them and saying, don't you realize that this is the moment that Ezekiel saw? This is the moment when the living, living waters get released in your life. I think that's awesome. Because Jesus was God's true tabernacle. God's true dwelling place, the Messiah. And the final twist to it is that like, everyone was out there in their little tabernacle, in their little tent, cooking their sausages. And it's a picture. Everyone in their own little tabernacles, Jesus isn't only saying that he is God's true tabernacle, God's dwelling place. He's telling them that all of those who believe Two will become God's dwelling place, and living waters will, will flow out of all who believe yeah. in Jesus. Just as the river of life flowed out of Jesus, it can flow out of us. Yes. Out of Adam, out of Chloe, the river of living water coming out of the innermost part of Jones. And what does it bring, this living water? It brings life. It brings life. We are called to be life bringers. To bring life to those around us. To turn the salt water into fresh. To bring freshness to this world. To bring freshness to your workplace, Ollie. To bring freshness to your neighbourhood. Like people are thirsty to bring joy and to bring the very presence, love, and power of God. We are sources. We're tabernacles. You're all just little tabernacles. Have a little look around. You're all little tabernacles. I mean, like, what a, pl what a plan that is. What a great man God had, that he didn't just want one. He didn't, Jesus wasn't just going to be the only one in whom God dwelled and out of whom the Spirit flowed. We can all be those. You get my point? That's what I think is going on in this saying of Jesus. He's talking about Ezekiel. He's talking about a historical moment where everything changed. And for us to receive this living water, we just believe in him. And if you've never believed in Jesus before, if you've never put your trust in Jesus, that's the starting point of receiving this life. 
and becoming a source of life to the world. Amen? Amen. So my, my first talk I said, be salty. In the third talk I'm saying, don't be salty, be fresh. <laughs> it's so confusing, but you get the point. Yeah. Be salty one day and also fresh as well. It's the same day. Uh, okay. I'm going to pray. Why don't we stand?